thing on here. There we go, Jerome, thank you so much. You know, Art has been going through quite a bit of physical pain and God has given him grace. And much grace as he's dealt with some of the physical issues. And so he is here by God's grace to serve and to lead. We thank you so much, Brother Art, for your ministry. And seasoned saint singers, they have a wonderful time of study on Saturdays on the second Saturday of each month. And um, we so appreciate their ministry. Let me ask you, Brother Troy, if you can come and replace my batteries as I use this mic here. Already the enemy is trying to interfere with the message and it will not work. Uh, there is a word for us today and it is a very appropriate word. And so take your Bible, if you will, and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We've been on a verse-by-verse -verse journey through the Gospel of Matthew for some time now. And we came to chapter 19 where Jesus addressed the issue of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And in that text, as you recall, last week Jesus laid the foundation for us that we might understand clearly the divine design behind marriage. Thank you, brother. And so we laid that foundation just so that we would not have a misunderstanding about these very delicate issues. We decided to also supplement that teaching with this uh, study today from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, which addresses additional issues related to marriage, remarriage, and divorce. And today the message is entitled, Wise Counsel for Christians. Wise Counsel for Christians. 1 Corinthians 7. Let me read the first, um, the first 14 verses or so. Uh, actually, I'll read down through verse 16. And then we will seek to understand God's Word. All right? If you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand. We have some extras in the back. We would love for everyone to follow along as we seek to understand God's Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's begin in verse 1. Everyone ready for the Scripture? Now follow along with me. Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does, and likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But this I say by way of concession, not of command. Yet I wish that all men or even as I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. Verse 8. But I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But to the married, I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and that the husband should not divorce his wife. 
But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband, and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? This is the word of the living God. Let's ask for his help as we study together. Father, our hearts are open wide. Fill our hearts with the right understanding of what you mean by what you say. Lord, we ask now that you would remove any barriers that would hinder us from hearing your word rightly. If there is pride or unconfessed sin or even a sense of uh, despising your truth or perhaps hard-heartedness, whatever it may be, Lord, you know. Would you aid us this morning by your spirit to turn away from those things and by faith to receive your word implanted, which is able to save our souls. In this we pray that you would be glorified. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. If Matthew 19 gives us the most comprehensive, forthright, and explicit statement from Christ concerning marriage, divorce, and remarriage, then 1 Corinthians chapter 7 gives us the highest and the most relevant treatment of sexuality and spirituality from the Apostle Paul. It was the professor Edward Donnelly who said, this chapter is the most modest, sensitive, and discreet teaching on human sexuality in human history, end quote. There is no guilt or shame in this chapter, but neither is there a false sense of idealism Paul presents to the Corinthians and to us a beautiful picture of love, of purity, and of the grace that redemption brings to our lives. You know, today we face some challenges. In marriage, we face some challenges when it comes to sexual purity. And this is a practical word for all of us, and we all need this word today. So let me take you back to the place where this teaching first unfolded. And let me seek to underline the impact that it made. 40 miles west of the great city of Athens was the cosmopolitan city of Corinth. Corinth was a port city about five miles in circumference, and it was a popular hotspot in the ancient times. If we could compare cities, ancient cities, to cities in our day and time, we could say that Ephesus was like Atlanta, Laodicea was like New York, Colossae was like Colorado, Philippi was like Pittsburgh, 
but Corinth. Corinth was like Las Vegas, but a thousand times worse. At that time, the city was known to be the home of at least 12 massive pagan temples rising high in the air on a hill in the south stood one of the seven wonders of the ancient world the temple of Aphrodite the Romans called her Venus the goddess of love this temple housed a thousand temple prostitutes. They would at night descend upon the city and would seek to facilitate idolatrous worship through sexual encounters. The money that they gained would be a part of what they would use to fund the very temple itself. It is recorded in antiquity that the sandals of these notorious priestesses of Aphrodite was studded with an imprint which spelled, follow me. And you could see that imprint in the dust of the streets. Charles Ryrie, the great Bible scholar, once wrote that ships wanting to avoid the dangerous trip around the southern tip of Greece were dragged across that particular place. The city boasted of an outdoor amphitheater that accommodated some 20,000 people. The athletic games that were held there were second only to the Olympics. The population was made up of Greeks and Romans and Orientals and it was noted for everything, everything sinful. Strabo, the historian, wrote all the people of Corinth gorge themselves and it is even customary in stage plays for actors to come onto the stage drunk. Every shop in the city had a deep spring-fed well to cool containers of wine. Now you've heard the statement, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Well, there was, an act, there was actually another description which was synonymous with the debauchery and the promiscuity and the, the depravity of Corinth. And it was a term, Corinthianize. It was against that black backdrop of life that God did an amazing work in this city. A spiritual awakening took place in Corinth. Did you know that? A spiritual revival took place. Their story is actually one that brings us a message of hope because it tells us that where, where Satan's darkness abounds, God's life can invade. It tells us that where the gates of hell were, as it were, God builds a church. God calls a people. And he rescues people from darkness to life. You see, their story tells us this, that God specializes in delivering sinners who are almost destroyed by evil. And he can rescue them and bring them life and joy and purity and grace. And so it doesn't really matter how ugly your background might be. It doesn't matter how unimpressive your pedigree might be. No life is too broken. No sin is too sinful. And no past is too checkered that it cannot be changed by Jesus Christ. That's the story of the church at Corinth. Now, how did this great work take place? Well, let me set this text in its historical context. Acts chapter 18, write that down. Acts chapter 18. It was about the year of A.D. 53. Paul arrived on the scene and preached the gospel 
in Corinth. And great success accompanied the word of God. But also great trials came to the Apostle Paul. It got so tough. It got so difficult that according to Acts chapter 18, verse 9, the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision these words. Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. Well, what Dr. Luke, the writer of Acts, meant was this. It was not that Paul would not be attacked. For if you read the account, Paul was attacked, but he was not harmed. He was not harmed physically. However, his purpose, his mission, his gospel advance would not be stopped by anyone who came against the Apostle Paul. For he gave Paul an assurance that there would be many people that he would call to himself in that city. Now keep in mind that at the time that Paul wrote this letter, or before that when Paul first arrived, there were not many converts there. And so what we are meant to understand is this, that we are meant to understand that God was promising to the Apostle Paul that there would be many people who would come to him that there would be a spiritual awakening and there would come to people, come people to Christ in a short period of time. Now the result of this awakening that took place meant that Paul had to stay there for at least 18 months. Why? Because there was all these problems. And Paul had to give pastoral counsel and direction to the church there. Well, we know the rest of the account, I trust. After leaving there, he made a second visit. And yet, the Corinthians were having so many problems that they wrote to Paul a letter. They were asking questions about some of the issues that they were facing. Questions like, do I have the right to remarry again? Questions like, what if I made a mistake in marriage? prior to my salvation? Am I stuck in the situation that I am in now? Questions like, well, what about uh, if I'm single? Uh, is it okay for me to stay in that condition? Or must I get married? They were asking questions about, well, what if I'm married to an unbelieving spouse? Uh, what do I do? Do I abandon the marriage? Go find me a believing spouse? Or do I stay in the marriage? What about second marriages? Third marriages? What about those things? These are some of the questions that Paul addresses in this chapter. Now, I'd like you to keep something in mind. This is all by way of introduction. Paul is speaking to an audience from a very pornographic, promiscuous, sinful culture. When Jesus was speaking in Matthew 19, he was speaking to the Jewish people who were restricted by the law. They had the law of God. They didn't have as many challenges in families as the Gentiles. But now Paul is speaking to a totally different audience and there were many issues. It was messy and Paul addresses some very serious issues. Now, to help you see where we're going, I want to show you in this text that Paul addresses seven questions in this chapter. These are, these are questions that are implied, and you can tell that they are implied because of the answer Paul gave. Now, I want to give you those seven questions, and then I'm only going to spend time on the first. Now, this doesn't mean that this will be a seven-part series, so relax. But I want to give you the broad frame and the outline of these questions so that when you come to this chapter, you will see that Paul is addressing these questions. Are you ready? 
Question number one. Is sex unspiritual? Is sex unspiritual? Paul actually addresses that question in the first seven verses, one through seven. Question number two. Should those formerly married marry? He addresses that in verses 8 and 9. Should those who are formerly married marry? Third, what are the alternatives for those who are married? What if I'm married to an unbeliever? What if that unbeliever tries to keep me from going to church? What if when I come home, you know, they are just involved in all sorts of stuff and they seem to hinder my Christian life? What do I do? Do I have the right to leave them? Must I stay? What do I do? What are the alternatives for those who are married? What if I stepped away from my spouse and yet I recognized that I, I was wrong? What do I do? He deals with that in these verses. Number four, now that I've become a Christian, what do I change? Now that I've become a Christian, what do I change? Well, what you see in verses 17 through 24 is that Paul gives straightforward instruction about that. Number five, should those never married marry? Should those never married marry? Verses 25 through 35. Two more. Number six. What about virgins? What about virgins? Or those who are single and have never been married and have remained pure, what about them? And then last, what about widows? Those who have been pressed into singleness by death. What about them? That's the entire chapter. Paul deals with all of those issues. Now, y'all going to have to help me today. And you could help me, first of all, by continuing to pay attention, but also by praying. But thirdly, by giving an amen or an oh me every now and then. Because I know this word is very nosy. This word will get into our lives in a very personal way. Again, time will not permit us to answer all these questions and to make our way through an entire chapter. Brother Andy already approached me and said, Pastor, are you going to preach through the whole chapter? I said, no, you know I can't make it through the whole chapter, brother. But we'll just walk through the first seven verses and answer the first question. And then, Lord willing, perhaps he will give me some liberty to come back and address several others. Okay? Do we need to pray again? Let's do it. Lord, as we come to your word here, be our teacher for Christ's sake. Amen. The first question that Paul addresses is the question, is sex unspiritual notice what he says in verse 1 now concerning the things about which you wrote it is good for a man not to touch a woman stop right there behind the scenes there were some Jewish influences in the church at Corinth who were putting pressure on Gentile Christians to get married for you understand that a Jew believed that it was actually not only your right, but your duty to marry. They would go all the way back to Genesis 1 where God said, be fruitful and multiply. And they would say that if you are uh, able to get married, you should. And they were pressuring Gentile Christians to get married. But also there were some unbiblical ungodly counsel that was floating through the church about the issue of celibacy and how 
to be truly devoted to the Lord. Some were suggesting that it doesn't matter whether you are uh, single or married, if you really, really want to be devoted to God, be celibate. Well, Paul makes that observation and he addresses the issue right up front. Now concerning, about, concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. The first thing that Paul does is he makes this observation about a worldly practice to forsake. A worldly principle or practice to forsake. That phrase, not to touch a woman, does not mean that a man cannot give a woman a handshake. It does not mean that you cannot give your sister a hug. It does not mean that you cannot pat a grieving girl on the back. Rather, that was a common Jewish euphemism, which means sexual intercourse or physical intimacy. Now, we know this is true because of several verses. Write these down. Genesis chapter 20, verse 6. Ruth, chapter 2, verse 9. And Proverbs, chapter 6, verse 29. Proverbs 6, verse 29 reads as follows. So is the one who goes into his neighbor's wife, whoever touches her will not go unpunished. So what Paul is saying here in verse 1 is this, that it is, it is, it is not a good thing for Christians who are single or unmarried to be sexually impure. Or to state it positively, it would be said this way. It is a good thing for Christians who are single and unmarried to be sexually pure. Now this is right in line with what he taught us in the book of 1 Thessalonians. So turn there with me if you will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 beginning in verse 3. There was a worldly practice that they were to forsake, and that is to live in sin. Paul says, no, it is good. It is good uh, to be pure, but it is not good to be impure. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. Follow along with me. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, the way, what sets Christians apart, their lifestyle of holiness. This is the way of holiness. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. We'll come back to that word in just a moment. That each of you know how to possess your own vessel, that is your body, in sanctification and honor. Not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress or defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger in all these things. Just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. Verse 8. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now in that culture, just like in our culture, sex outside of marriage was encouraged. Sex outside of marriage was exalted as normal, as right, as good. But Paul says no, for those who profess to be Christians, for them to live in sexual immorality is against not only our calling, but it's against God's word. And so he challenges them to forsake that worldly practice. 
we are to forsake it because God has given us a divine provision to enjoy. Go back now with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and notice verse 2. But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. And so Paul makes this observation. You must forsake this worldly practice, but he makes a qualification. Because of the dangers of sexual impurity, I want to give you a word about monogamy. And I want to speak against polygamy. The word of monogamy is you're to have your own wife or your own husband. The word against polygamy is it's just one. Just one wife, just one husband. Now notice what he is saying here in verse 2. But because of, there's the word, immorality. Some versions translate that word fornication. But notice here, Paul uses the plural. Bearing in mind their past conduct, Paul says, because of immoralities or to avoid sexual sin, there is a provision to enjoy. What is the provision? Marriage. Marriage. Let's uh, open up that word immorality just for a second. It's, uh, again, it's translated fornication in some versions. The word fornication comes from the Greek word pornea, which means sexual sin of all kind. The word pornography actually comes from two words, porno and graphe. Porno means prostitute, graphe means writing. And when you put those two together, it speaks of the lying story that a prostitute tells. And what is that lying story? That lying story is that you can have sex apart from love. That you can have sex apart from commitment. That you can have sex apart from morality. That you can have sex apart from responsibility. That is a lie. Why is that a lie? Because the moment you go there sexually, you're going to have your emotions involved. It's going to ha cost you something in uh, responsibility, and it is a moral issue. Sex outside of marriage is sin, and it's wrong, and it's a lie. And let me prove it to you with the Word of God. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, just one page back. And I'd like you to notice what Paul says in verse 12. Now, Paul is not trying to guilt them. He's trying to guide them. He's not trying to hammer them. He's trying to instruct them about sex and that sex is not unspiritual. It just is to be expressed within the confines of of a committed relationship, of marriage. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Verse 13. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. In other words, God wants to be glorified in your body. Verse 14. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself with a prostitute is one body with her. For he says the two shall become one flesh. Notice verse 17. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Verse 18. 
flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. In other words, it's a sin that you commit that never leaves your body because you commit it with your body and it stays with you. Though you can be cleansed and forgiven and restored, that is a sin against your body. He goes on, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Did you see what he's saying there? Therefore, glorify God in your, in your body, in your body. So what Paul is teaching here is that each man is to have his own wife, each woman is to have her own husband. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. Now the word have in verse 2 implies not only marriage, but it implies physical intimacy. And I'd like you to notice now two things that we must get from this verse. Number one, Paul is not saying that marriage is simply a way to have lawful sex. He is not saying that marriage is much more than that. Singleness is good. There are some advantages. But marriage is much more than a legal way to have marital relations. That's the first thing he wants us to see. Marriage is more than a way to avoid sin. What is marriage? Marriage is a part of God's plan. It's a creation ordinance. And this will be on the quiz next week, so I want you to write it down. There is a five-fold purpose for marriage, and I just want to give you the words and the verses, and you can read them later. What is the purpose of marriage? Number one, procreation. Genesis 1.26. Number two, partnership. Genesis 2.18. God said it's not good for a man to be alone. Number three, pleasure. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. That there is a pleasure that is to come in marriage. Number four, purity. Purity. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Thessalonians 4. And the last purpose of marriage is that it is a picture, a picture of the covenant love that God has with the church. So let me repeat those five P's. They'll be on the quiz next week. Number one, procreation. Number two, partnership. Number three, pleasure. Number four, purity. It keeps us pure, helps us to be pure. Number five, it's a picture. And Paul would have us to know from verse two that marriage is not to be seen as simply a way to avoid sin. It's more than that. The second thing he would have us to see is this, that marriage is the only legitimate way to enjoy sexual fulfillment. It is the only legitimate way. This is what he means when he says that you must have your own wife or your own husband, not someone else's, but your own. Now, may I say it again, not to condemn, but to be straight and clear that extramarital sex is wrong, it's damaging, it's sinful. God wants two people to enjoy that expression within the bounds of a committed, loving relationship of marriage. Now at this point, there must have been someone behind the scenes 
teaching that abstinence was being encouraged in the confines of marriage. Someone was teaching that all sex was bad, it was unspiritual, and if you really wanted to be holy, if you really wanted to be devoted to Christ, then you must abstain, even if you are married. Paul says, now wait a minute. There is a biblical provision to enjoy. Verse three. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise, also the wife to her husband. Bottom line, you know what he's saying here? Celibacy has no place in marriage. There are certain obligations that are unique to the marriage status. What are those privileges? Well, notice he says it's a responsibility that we both share. The husband must fulfill this duty to his wife and the wife to her husband. You see, there is a mutual obligation to meet each other's needs. Now today there's a great deal of emphasis right now about equality in this world. And we're seeing commercials about equality and the Bible does teach that man and women or woman is equal in the sight of God in dignity, although we have different functions in the home. But this is another area where Paul says there is another equality that is shared between the man and the woman. And what is it? It is the responsibility to meet each other's needs. It's not simply a privilege. It's not simply a pleasure. Now come up close now. It's a duty. It's a duty that we are to fulfill and to serve with one another. Let your eyes drop to the verse and let the word of God guide you. Notice verse three. The husband must fulfill his what? His duty. The words fulfill and the words duty paint a picture of a debt that we owe to one another, a debt. You see, the ground is equal when it comes to this issue of meeting each other's needs. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. Now, what is the duty? The duty is the duty of physical relations within the marriage. Paul is teaching that celibacy is wrong for married people. It's more on. Now again, the stress here is on equality, but it's also on consistency. The tense of the verb, fulfill his duty, is in what is called a present continuous tense, which makes it clear that this duty, this duty that we both share, is to be an habitual duty, not a spasmodic duty. Now I cannot define habitual for your marriage, and I cannot define spasmodic for your marriage. You have to figure that out. But the point that Paul is making here is this. Marriage is to be one that the couple continually seeks to meet each other's needs and to make their relations the best, the highest thing possible in the marriage. Why? Because it is the most sacred and special place. Physical intimacy within marriage is not only a duty that is honored by God, it is a responsibility that we are given. A responsibility. It's not a demand that just the husband makes, but it's one that both must fulfill to each other. And so let me say this 
sex outside of marriage is unrighteous. But a marriage without sex is unnatural. It fails to honor God. Celibacy has no place in marriage. Now, Paul reinforces this mutual obligation in verse 4. He says, The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now, what does that mean? What in the world is Paul saying? Well, the phrase have authority over does not mean that we exercise some type of heavy-handed dictatorship of guilt over the other person. Let's be clear about that. First and foremost, our bodies, if you are Christian, your body belongs to the Lord. First and foremost. That's proven to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. But once we get married, once we commit ourselves to another person in the marriage relationship, now that other spouse has a timeshare, if you will, in our lives. When we make that vow in marriage, you give up a certain right. And do you know what that right is? That's the right to yourself alone. That's right. You give up the exclusive right to yourself. When you are single, it's just you. When you're married, now you belong to the Lord and to this person. So what Paul is saying here is this. Mutually submit to one another. You belong to one another. For a man to deprive his wife is to deprive himself. For a wife to deprive her husband, she is depriving herself. You belong to one another. Submit to one another. <laughs> I ran across a an old Celtic wedding vow that I think puts this beautifully. Both the bride and the groom say this to one another. Listen to this carefully. You cannot possess me, for I belong to myself. But while we both wish it, I will give you that which is mine to give. You cannot command me, for I am a free person, but I shall serve you in those ways you require. And the honeycomb will taste sweeter coming from my hand. I pledge to you that yours will be the name I cry aloud in the night and the eyes into which I smile in the morning. I pledge you my, the first bite of my meat and the first drink of my cup. Now listen to this. I pledge you my living and my dying, each equally in your care. I shall be a shield for your back and you for mine. I will not slander you, nor you me. I will honor you above all others. And when we quarrel, we will do so in private and tell no strangers of our grievances. This is my wedding vow to you, the marriage of equals. I think they got it just right. When they would say that to each other, then the minister would follow and the old Celtic minister would say, may the road rise up to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Listen, we have a responsibility that we share with each other. And there's a reinforcement that we belong to each other. And I love the way they would put it in the old wedding hymn or wedding vows. I belong to you. You belong to me. That's the ideal here. But now Paul rebukes some people. Verse 5. Stop depriving one another. 
except by agreement for a time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now what this indicates is that within the community of Christian believers in Corinth, ah, spouses were depriving their mates of their mutual rights. And this word deprive here, underline it in your Bible. It's a word that means to steal, to rob, to withhold something that is their right to have. It's a strong word. And it suggests something dishonest about the severance of marital relations within the marriage. And so Paul is reinforcing something very important. He is saying, yes, it's good for single people to withhold from having sex until they're married. That's good. But if you are married, it is not good for married couples because sexual relations or physical intimacy is God-ordained and it's God-commanded. And what Paul is seeking here to do is to rectify some problems. Let me put it to you this way. Uh, the New Testament scholar Pryor offers this reminder. At the practical level, this is a very challenging word to all Christian couples. Many reasons are given for withholding what is due to the other. Tiredness, resentment, disinterest, boredom. For the Corinthian husbands, so wedded to their own rights, this very practical instruction must have been something of a body blow, end quote. It is a body blow to us here today, too, in Phoenix. I know why it's so quiet in here. Because that takes place within marriage. Now, if I look at you, I'm not implying anything. I got to look somewhere. But listen, this happens in marriage where people start depriving people or the other of intimacy. Paul says, stop. Stop doing it. Now, he's going to explain why you must stop doing it, but before he does, he wants us to understand that verse 4 gives us no right to use this verse as leverage over the other spouse. You can't use verse 4 to try to lead your spouse out of the will of God. Now, let me put it another way. God is still the complete owner of every Christian. A person's spouse has a part ownership, if you will, but that spouse does not get the right to lead me out of the will of God. In other words, I must only do in the marriage bed what God permits. I cannot go outside of it or do anything that is outside of God's will. This verse is not sanctioning compromise in order to please your spouse. Compromise does not honor God. Now, I've been in ministry almost 30 years as a pastor. And I have heard about every argument and excuse when it comes to meeting a spouse's needs. This verse, verse 4, does not say to believing spouses, you can compromise with your unbelieving spouse or your believing spouse outside of the will of God. Every Christian must stay within the will of God. We have an obligation to meet our spouse's needs, but if our spouse says, stay home from church, he said, no, I'm sorry, I gotta go to church, but I'll touch base with you later. Your spouse says, I want you to do this, and it's outside of God's will. We said, well, no, I can't do that, but I'll still, I'll meet your needs, but I'm not going to get outside God's will. Sexual expression 
within marriage is not just an option or an extra. Paul says it's a responsibility and there is to be no deprivation. None. Physical intimacy is not to be used as a tool for manipulation or reward. You've been very nice this week. This is your reward. No. It is not a payoff for good behavior. It is not a manipulation to get what you want. It is a right that each person shares and that it's a duty before God. Now there is an exception. And the exception is given in verse 5. Stop depriving one another. In other words, stop holding yourself off from each other. Stop it. And then he says, except by way of what? Agreement for a time. That you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. In other words, Paul says there's one exception where you should hold off in marriage. But it must meet a threefold condition. Condition number one, it must be mutual. There must be a mutual consent. Both the husband and the wife must agree to withhold, not just one informing the other. I think we're going to withhold. No, it must be an agreement. It must be a mutual consent. Number two, the abstinence must be temporary. It must be for a limited time. Condition number three, it must happen only for the purpose of prayer. Both the husband and the wife must be convinced that the abstinence is desirable and the best thing for them, not just one. In other words, one spouse can't just impose this responsibility on someone else. Now, there may be times, there may be times when this mutual and temporary abstinence happens. Let me give you an example of when it may happen. It may happen when there is a grief with a child who has gotten into some serious trouble or uh, perhaps illness in, in, the, uh, in the, one of the couple's lives and they agree uh, to withhold for a short period of time so that they might pray. Let me give you the example of, uh, of a child. You're, say you have a child who's gotten into some serious, serious trouble and both of the parents are grieved about this. It may be right not to go to bed but to get on your knees beside the bed and pray together and to go to the Lord about that matter until some of the grief can be comforted by the power of God before going forward. But that must be an agreement. Just as you would fast for a day or two for spiritual purposes, couples might agree to refrain from physical intimacy in order to give themselves more fully to prayer. But that's just an example, okay? That's just an example. When that urgent need passes, Paul says, come back together quickly. Why? So that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, I have seen so many marriages wrecked by Satan because one or the other did not understand this principle and they deprived their spouse of this way to stay close. And Satan used that to tempt one or the other and led to a breakup in that marriage. Satan will attack if you are not careful in this area, this verse tells us 
that sexual relationships within a marriage protect the couple. It helps to protect each other. Now listen, those of you here with children, don't, don't squirm. I know you've been squirming this whole time, every time I mention the word sex, but it's better for your children to hear about sex in the church from the scriptures than for them to hear it from the world without the Bible context. So it's important for us not to squirm at these things, but to receive God's word here because it's pure, it's right, it's good, it's holy. So as Paul closes this particular section, he says in verse 6, but I say this by way of concession, not of command. What does he mean by that? He is saying, I am not commanding you to get married if you are single. And I am not commanding that you stay single. I am aware of the advantages of being single. I'm aware of the advantages of being married. He is simply saying, I'm trying to give you instruction. I'm not giving you a divine command that you must get married or you must stay single. But if you wish to get married, you may. You can be spiritual and be single. You can be spiritual and be married. That's what he is saying. Spirituality is not determined by marital status. But then he adds, kind of in closing, his own preference, verse 7. Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. And what was Paul? Yes, at the time that Paul wrote this letter, Paul was single or unmarried. However, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, he gives us a profile and he tells us that he was circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee. Before Paul became a Christian, he was an Orthodox Jew. He met all of the requirements that were set before him. All of the Jewish orthodoxy that was set before him. He was a Pharisee, and to be a Pharisee, you had to be married. So most likely, the Apostle Paul, who was Saul at the time, was married by the time he was 18, and as a member of the Sanhedrin Council, he had to be married. But now he is not married. What happened? When you get to heaven and you walk down Amen Boulevard and turn up Hallelujah Square, maybe you'll find Paul there shining with the glory of Jesus Christ and say, Paul, what happened? And he'll give you the answer. I don't know what happened. I don't know why he was single at the time. I don't know why he was unmarried. But either one of two things are true. Either he was abandoned by his wife when he came to faith in Jesus Christ, or she died. And then God gave him the gift of celibacy and he spent the rest of his days seeking to win the world to Christ. Either way, what this means for us is this. Paul understands where you are. He understands what it means to be married and he understands what it means to be single. And Paul has been the product of a broken marriage, but he has also lived the life of a single person. 
And many people would argue that the most spiritual man in history besides Moses was the Apostle Paul, who made more of a difference for Jesus Christ than anyone who has lived on the face of the earth. What Paul would have us to know is this. You can be spiritual and single, and you can be spiritual and married. The place to start is with the Lordship of Christ in your own heart. Right where you are, are you surrendered to God? Are you surrendered to Christ? Don't try to change your circumstances to help you get spiritual. Just get spiritual where you are. And God might use you in your singleness or in your marriage state, but nevertheless start right where you are. Paul's counsel is this. If you've been neglecting your spouse, repent. Turn away from doing your own thing. Surrender to God. Surrender to your spouse. Meet your spouse's needs. If you are single and you've been stepping out and committing sin outside of marriage, stop it. Turn around. Repent. Trust Christ. Surrender your heart. But it all starts with Jesus. You can breathe now. And I can too. What a word. What a word. Can you imagine if Christians take this advice, what witness it will give to the world? When as a single person you say, you know, I have desires, but I'm going to wait on the Lord to bring me the proper spouse, and I'm going to make a wise decision at that point, but I'm going to be pure. What kind of witness that will be? And what kind of witness it is for married couples to say, I belong to him and to my spouse, and I give myself to the Lord and to my spouse, because not only it's my obligation, but it's my desire. It's what I want to do. I want to honor God in my marriage. Perhaps then the world will listen to the message we preach. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray even now for young people in our church right now who see the difficulties of marriage and see the wreckage of divorce and they have convinced themselves that marriage is a bad thing. And Lord, I pray that you would help them to see that it's not that marriage is bad, it's that sin is bad. It's that our hearts are bad and this is why we need you. Lord, I pray for single people in this church who have been brought into singleness by death or by divorce. I pray, Lord, that you would remind them that the blood of Jesus cleanses and that the grace of God keeps. I pray that you would give them strength and endurance to, to stand and to continue to walk in purity. And that that testimony would be used to draw many to yourself. I pray, Lord, that you would help them to give their energies to the kingdom of God and to serving you, that you would surround them with wise friends who support and encourage them. I pray that for us as a church, Lord, that we would not
foster cliques within the church, but that we would recognize that we are a part of a family, all redeemed by Jesus Christ. And Lord, uh, for the couples in our church who have manipulated and struggled and been challenged at this point of how to meet each other's needs, Lord, I pray that you would give them the grace to receive your word and not to open their marriage to the attack of the evil one. That you would help them, Lord, to protect each other and to work through reasonably and righteously all of the difficulties. I pray that you would give men grace to lead and women grace to do your will, that together we might honor you in all that we say and in all that we do. This is our desire, and we pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,